welcome to uh, my in conversations, Mr. Steve Dougal from Buzzcox. Yeah. Nice to see you, John. So, uh, Steve, this is this is a uh, kind of a very strange time in the history of Buzzcox because uh, Pete recently died. So that's this obviously must have put you in a, well, a, t a turmoil, a state of turmoil. Well, yeah, I mean, um, nobody anticipated it. It was a, a shock because it was kind of instant, you know. It, uh, one minute was at home and the next minute was so hospital and a heart attack. And I got a call off the manager a couple of hours later and um, and that was it. So there was no kind of build-up to it, you know. We uh, we had some shows booked for um, sort of four weeks ahead of that. And um, it put everything in turmoil, really, yeah. And... Um, Turn my life upside down, so you get all the memories and um, you know, we met when we was 20 years old and we were together 43 years, you know, through hell and high water, <laughs> yeah, through, yeah. through yeah. the birth of punk to, you know, uh, the madness of touring, making great records and everything. So we, uh, we spent a lot of time together and did a lot of things together. So when you think about it, you know, like it, it's kind of most my life, like it was his, you know, mm. so it was... Uh, I remember you once telling me it was like, it's like a dysfunctional marriage, really. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was. And I said, it was like two mountain, mountain climbers, both going up the mountain side together. If one goes off, the other does, you know. <laughs> it was that kind of thing. It's a combination where, as two artists, or being in a band, you know, that's, that dynamic makes the band, really, and that's really what we had, you know. He really couldn't have done it without me and I couldn't have done it without him. It's kind of the way it works in, in great bands. So, um, you know, it's a massive loss on every level, you know, like say on a personal level, as a mate going through all the interesting times and all the times in the pubs drinking and um, talking about philosophy and selling jokes, you name it, you know, cover the whole, all the things you do in life. and. Um, and being in the studio and making great music and being on the stage, all the, the power, you know. I mean, I mean, a lot of people always like to portray you and, and Pete as being quite chalk and cheese, quite different characters. You write quite different, often quite different songs in Buzzcocks, but sometimes mm. they cross over. Is that true or, or were you actually far more similar than people would perceive? Well, I used to say we're polar opposites, but Pete said we're not. So I think it, he didn't <laughs> like that. I mean, I didn't mind it. I, th I, think, I thought we complemented each other and that mm. was the thing. Um, but um, there was a lot of similarities, really. We was the same person, but uh, <laughs> same person, but t two different people as well, two different sides to the same character, really. You know, um, there was a lot of things in in common more than perhaps we realised. You know, so um, it made it interesting that on that level. You know, we, we sort of liked a lot of the same things, but. Um, when I wrote that song, Autonomy, I sang in a high-pitched voice and I said, this is like a question and answer thing. So I'll sing the sort of question and you sing the answer bit. Now I sang it in a pitch that's similar to his. So I went, it's a thing that's worth having. And he went, yes, I would. After that song, I thought we can't be singing, you know, I can't be singing like him, you know, because I was kind of finding my voice really. I think it was that was my first song singing for the Buzzcocks. And, um, after that, I thought I've got to find a different vein, you know. So, so I tried to go a bit more opposite, you know, to to differentiate us, you know. And if he'd do a nice song, I'd try and do a horrible one. It's a, it's a rougher, <laughs> yeah, more yeah. rocky one, you know. But then you get labelled as the hard rock. Yeah, I was going to say, did you find frustrating that you kind of got into that you put into that corner of being, you know, the, the uh, Buzzcox rock and roll kind of presence. I mean, it's obviously it's yeah. a, lot of, a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. But people um, overlook that, because you're, you're quite arty as well, aren't you? Your brother's an artist and you do have a very artistic songwriting thing as well, don't you? Well, yeah. I mean, um, when we met, we had the same kind of things, you know. We'd read the books, the art and all that. We're working class kids, but we was aware of all this stuff. This is your way out of, out of going mad and getting a job as a window cleaner or something, <laughs> you know. It's like, you know, we was aware of all that stuff. So, you know, even though I didn't know Pete then, we'd come from a similar thing, you know, in that kind of way, interested in art and the literature and all that stuff, and rock and roll, you know. But so, um, yeah, but um, I thought, well, somebody's got to do a bit of rocking on the stage. So that was kind of my job, really, waving the guitar and putting a bit of balls into the thing, because mm. he was, like, a bit more sensitive, but, but I was as well, you know. Mm. 
When you meet girls and you lay in bed with them, you talk about poetry or something. That was quite a shock for me. <laughs> <laughs> going, well, oh, we could talk people as well. Don't really, yeah, <laughs> yeah. People don't know that side of you. Know, yeah, yeah. You know, if you take somebody to an art gallery or this, that, and you know. I, I used to really love it watching Buzz Cox when people stand there and he'd, he'd be looking at you kind of going, like that sort of tutting and you'd be going crazy. And I used to love that balance. It was so... It's quite funny to watch in the crowd, in a really cool way. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, he always looks in disdain. And, you know, <laughs> I look at him, do you, think, do you think I like doing this? But somebody's got to do it. You've got to find a role in the band. Ah, you know? did like it as well. Though. I did as well. Yeah. I mean, it had to be, because don't forget, I mean, you know, I loved the, uh, the Clash and the Pistols and all that. So I brought a bit of them rock and roll elements in, you know, because I grew up with all that. You remember seeing Little Richard and Chuck Berry and stuff on Granada TV, you know. So that was wild and ballsy and energetic. So I've got a bit of that fire in my belly of that, you know. And that's what punk needed as well, you know. It wasn't all just kind of, you know, sensitive for flower stuff, you know. I mean, it was... Uh, well, it needed to be lived with, yeah. with that. So we had the right balance, yeah. And um, it did make me laugh when I do that, you know. <laughs> Occasionally when I'd go up to him and I'd say something, like those News at Ten readers, people always wonder what we said, you know. <laughs> but I'd say things like, they're all right today, or come on, you're doing all right, you know, and he'd laugh, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it was a double act in that way, you know, it was a combination that works, because he had a, a really good sense of humour as well, you know, so, which not a lot of people know, really, I don't he, think. He was really funny. He was a yeah, funny yeah. guy, he had, like, yeah. jokes for every occasion and all that, which alleviates, you know. The last time I saw the two of you together was that festival in Croatia, mm. and we had a really good laugh afterwards. And, and you're both finishing each other's lines off. I noticed that <laughs> people have known each other for such a long time. Yeah, but it was it was funny. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Spending that long with each other, um, uh, doing all that, and um, I, I, I saw a documentary where Ray Davis said, you know, I, I realised, you know, rather than confronting people with stuff, um, I used humour very early on. You know. And in the eye of the hurricane in the early punk days, I mean, there was a very serious intent when we started. But as you get older than that, you cannot sustain that. A party don't last forever, you know, it, it has to change in some ways. And um, so that humour alleviated us from massive tours and, um, you know, putting singles out every two months back in like 78 and two albums, I think, that year and all that kind of stuff. So you've got to have some release, you know. I told Kirk Cobain that, and he went, a sense of humour, like he'd never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> and to try and explain to him what it was, you know. Yeah. So you've, you've got to have that side as well, you know, um, to relieve the pressures and enable you to survive all this stuff, you know. Yeah, because Buscos always toured hard. Mm. Yeah. In, in the early days, it was like 32 day tours at a time, and um, I think the agent gave us a mirror once with, uh, one year, I think it was 78, we did about 82 shows so that was quite a lot in those days you know not many were doing that that amount of touring every year you know um so that was a lot and in between that um uh, coming up with the songs and recording the songs and all that so we did a, a lot really you know but um with that become the touring and the intensity of it all and the wild times as well, you know, if you don't embrace that when you're 20, I mean, this is part of your reward for getting there, you know. Weren't you still embracing that when you were 60, though? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> you embrace it as long as you can, you know. Yeah, until, yeah. Until one day you've got to kind of go, hold on a minute, I can't do that anymore. Which is a terrible day because <laughs> it's elements of your youth, it's elements of enjoying life. Mm. It's like Turner tying himself to the mass to experience all the elements. And that's what I thought it was, bring it all mm. on, you know. Bring the drink, the drugs, the girls, bring the songs, bring the muse, bring the poetry, and bring the rock, the punk rock and roll, you know. So, so when, so, when so are you going to stop then? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not due to stop for another couple of years, yeah. <laughs> You did text me at five o'clock this morning. I, I figured you was probably still up then, yeah. Yeah, it was a long night. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> my record was 11 days no sleep in uh, America on a tour once. Yeah. <laughs> That was pushing it a bit, you know. <laughs> and Pete on the road wasn't that much calmer, was he? No, I mean, um, he had a lot of um, crazy days as well, you know, a lot of times. Um, mm. But when, when he was off the road back in, when he was in Estonia, he was quieter there. Well, is that, was yeah. that his way of 
balancing it? Because I, I get the feeling you just carry on when you're off the road as well. Well, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Until maybe last week. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> I have done, yeah. But um, it's all, it, that's the way I work, you know, that's, um, that's what uh, keeps me interested and energised with it all, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you're kind of, you know, still in love with, um, with the music and the rock and roll and where it takes you. And, uh, there's a kind of price you have to pay for that. A lot of people, see a lot of people, they start off in bands and then they last a year and go, I couldn't handle it and all this kind of stuff. Well, you know, you, you've got to go over those hurdles onto other levels. And the older you get, the more trying it is for people. But I did embrace it and luckily I had the constitution to deal with it. I'm not saying it's taken me to the edge many times, but I kind of like that, you know. Mm. Um, I've just been writing a song called Magic Ways and Magic Days, you know, and, uh, you know, that's dealing with the things in magic. Now, I'm not, you know, but there is magic and weird stuff in the world, you know, that you have to deal with on many levels, you know, and many traumas and tragedies that people tell you about, including yourself. But I said to an end of mine this morning, just bring it all on. It's part of a, a day in the life of your life, you know. Mm. If you thought life was going to be easy, you know which me managed to interpret in a lot of songs, really. So you have to live and breathe the part, you know. It's, um, it's not an act or some kind of show business stunt, you know. It's, it's this is what yeah. we are, yeah. It's just we talk about interpreting in the songs, because one of the great things, one, one of the utter magic things about Buzzcocks, I mean, yeah, it's melodically fantastic, the twin guitar thing's great, mm. but it's a way that both you and Pete could get a really complex subject matter and squash it into, like, really, uh, you know, two or three lines, you know, that's... You know, like what you just talked about there, like that song you're trying now. Mm. It's, it's pretty deep, but you also managed to make it very, very, like a small pill, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, when I was young, I remember reading uh, Chekhov and stuff, and he's, he said that simplicity is everything. And even that statement is simple. <laughs> um, I thought, wow, that's pretty powerful, really. And I think we managed to do that in a, way, a lot of ways, make these complex things seem simple, you know. Um, and that is the art of a like three three minute song, really, isn't it? If you can get enough information, but make it seem like um, you know, deliver it so simple and easy, you know, it's um, it's a lot harder to do than be verbose and go on forever and ever with it, you know, and not exactly get there, you know. So, so when you're writing, that. would you bring the whole song in, or would you? bring three quarters of song in, just work it out together? Most, I mean, most of mine were always kind of worked out to a certain extent, you know. I mean, uh, the first one for me was Fast Cars. I had the music and the chorus, and I had the words at home, but I, Howard DeVoto was the singer then, so I thought, well, they're the singers, they better write the verse to this, put the words on there. Even though I had mine, I wasn't, you know, I'd, we'd just started. It's like, well, one of you guys have got to sing it, maybe. So that's what happened with that one. And the same with Promises, I left the words at home on a demo and then I said, you, you know, I had the music, the chorus, Promises, oh, you know, that's the song to me. You can put anything in the middle sometimes. Oh, the but, <laughs> and I said to Pete, you've turned it into a love song, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was supposed to be Promises about the government. <laughs> so after that, I did my own Needed Ears. And um, mainly we'd bring finished, well, it was whoever wrote the chords and Whoever had the chorus, really, it was their song, you know. So quite often Pete would have the chords and some words and a chorus, and I would do the same and we'd bring it to the band like that. Then we'd put the riffs on, like uh, everybody's happy nowadays. I couldn't hear what he was doing. I said, oh, I can't be bothered. I'll do this four-note riff, you know. So combinations like that worked. And I'd say to him, like, look, I've got this song that goes like this, and... He'd just come up with a riff for the mm. middle of it, you know. So it's quite random. Yeah. Yeah. And we never sat down. We used to think it was funny. You'd hear people next door rehearsing in his studios going, oh, I think there's a fifth and a seventh and all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we knew each other that well that we couldn't actually sit down and write a song together like that. Yeah. I think I could have possibly done with him, but it, it, we knew each other too well. It's like we couldn't fool each other with that. You know? <laughs> so you sort of brought him in from home, really, and then 
in a rehearsal room got together doing it like that. You know. So I mean, what was it like when you initially joined the band? Because you, I mean, famously you were walking past the Free Trade Hall on the way to mm. meeting some in the pub about another band. Mm. And Malcolm McLaren told you to come in and this guy here wants to, you to join a band, which is Pete Shelley, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, one of the most fantastic random mm. walks ever. You've gone the other side of the Free Trade Hall, you probably would end up in Buzzcocks. Yeah. I mean, so, so you end up joining this band who were... Um, they're kind of kind of weird, kind of weird hip art kids, aren't they? And you're just <clears throat> from the street. So, mm. was it very accepting? You know, when you go, you know, the first initial meeting and rehearsals, was it was it that open that you could just go in and write a song for them? Or, well, yeah, I thought. Well, I was um, playing with two guys around the corner, but I knew they really didn't mean it. You know, <laughs> mm. so I was looking for other people, and uh, I'd answered this ad in the paper. Stood outside and. Um, I think we was doing, I had this song Fast Cars and we was doing um, Paranoid and Brown Sugar because this guitar guy had an open tuning so that's where they could play. So we was doing all that but I said we need to write our own because I'd just come out of living in a house full of people taking acid and I'm like, <laughs> I'm out of here, you know, I, I can't listen to Emerson, Lake and Palmer anymore. I was listening to The Who and stuff and um, three minute songs, smashing the game. And I'd also seen about the uh, auto-destructivism of people on the telly in the 60s smashing pianos mm. and um, making sculptures that exploded and stuff. So I kind of like that destructive element, which when you heard the pistol saying destroy, that made sense to me. It was like... Um, and so Malcolm McLaren said that in here they do a, a version of Substitute, you know. So I thought... I said, well, I'm in then. So I went inside and I thought, I don't know anything about this. So I'm talking to Pete Shelley at Cross Purposes in the bar and uh, saying about joining a band. And I thought, well, I don't know about this, you know. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm supposed to meet someone else. <laughs> but anyway, we sat at the back of the free trade hall. I think there was about 15 people there on the first one with rows and rows of seats talking about uh, making a band and stuff like that. <clears throat> and. Uh, I think he'd answered an ad of Howard's about the Velvet Underground. Well, I knew all about that as well. I knew all about Andy Warhol because of my brother as an art student. So I was well aware of that stuff. But um, what I still maintain is some of them uh, covers like The Kinks and a lot of them 60s record art is different than art. Um, you know, art in the galleries a lot of ways. The, the art of record sleeves is something unique as well, you know. Mm. And I think that's the difference for me, you know, sometimes. Um, um, in fact, I had to explain to Malcolm Garrett, we need a picture on the front of the first album. He was going to put a collage of cabbages and all that. Well, that was a bit too arty for me. I said, <laughs> you've got to think like Rembrandt. You want to see people's faces because that will tell a million things. More than a collage, mm. that doesn't represent me at the moment, you know. So there was, there's that fine line or that grey area of artiness, you know. Mm. And being from the streets and, um, you know, um, <clears throat> seeing the working class movement really, uh, people like the Clash and the Jam and the Pistols and the Dam, um, I had them elements. So uh, the artiness, you've got to be a little bit careful, you know. Mm. Especially when people start going in inverted commas, you know. And it used to be from Didsbury or somewhere in Manchester. You know, it's like, well, hold on a minute, man. You know what I mean? Let's, let's talk it a bit easier. I mean, I know Pete was from Lee, one in he lived yeah. in, I mean, he's from the same background as you, isn't he? Yeah. But they'd, they'd already spent a couple of years in an art school environment, haven't they? There's, there's, yeah. there's Howard, there's Linda, there's Pete. And they've got a very arty take on things. Yeah. But were they kind of surprised that this, this kind of random kid that just walked in could actually keep up with it, <clears> what they're thinking? Well, yeah, because... Um, at first, I thought it's a little bit of an affectation what they're doing. You know, <laughs> I thought I can see through that bullshit. I used to listen to Bob Dylan, <laughs> <laughs> um, but in another way, it had its charm, you know. But um, see, Howard said to me when we first started, we're all changing our name, you know. And I remember uh, John Lennon saying, "Look, um, Bob Dylan is Robert Zinnerman, you know." I'm John Lennon, I didn't change my name. <laughs> Howard said to me, uh, why don't you change your name to Moles Rothman or Marcel Vogue or something? <laughs> I'm like, look, man, I'm Steve Diggle, I'm staying to it, you know. You've already got quite a good name, actually. It, yes. sound, it sounds made up already, <laughs> didn't it? Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> tailor made. So, um, so there was that side to them, but it, mm. I, 
I understood a lot of it, and I, I liked a lot of it, but it, it was certain things, that, that was them more than me, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, how Pete Shelley got that from Lee, I don't know, but I think he adopted that kind of Bowie artist stance a little bit. Mm. Uh, with Howard, you know, sort of, in, in other areas, in his sort of Samuel Beckett kind of thing, you know. So, <clears throat> they were surprised I'd read James Joyce and stuff like that, you know. Being a working class kid, it was that thing, you know, if you can't be a footballer or a boxer, you know, to read the books and try and get, you know, understand the world you was uh, living in and stuff like that. My granddad was a trade union man. I uh, saw a lot, of, he wouldn't have an office, he lived in, um, in the street in Bradford. Could have had a flash car and all that. He worked from the front parlor. And I've seen a lot of people, you know, with families of nine and stuff, you know, guys losing their arm and trying to get compensation, all that. So that put me in a thing as well. And my granddad was a self-educated man. That, seeing all that stuff put me in the right frame for punk, I thought, you know, seeing that kind of thing going on. There's always been an element of that in Manchester, aren't there? This, this idea that, you know, you may be... Um, stands to be the bottom of society, you know, like a mill worker, terrible money, bad conditions. There's always that thing of pulling yourself up and the teaching yourself, you know, looking outwards all the time. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's the greatest thing because um, uh, a friend of mine went to Ample Fourth School. Actually, give me his due, he was uh, left on a doorstep in the Lake District and adopted, but he went there and got the posh accent. He'd never read half the books I'd read because <laughs> when he's putting a plate to like that, it's meaningless, you know. Ezra Pound said, read five books, but know them well, you know, stuff like that. So I would read slowly and carefully and appreciate, you know. Mm. It's, um, you know, my, uh, I went to a comprehensive school. Pete went to a grammar school, you know. I said, you still end up with me, man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's the yeah. difference. You've got to have that mix, you know. And you don't get that depth and insight sometimes when it's on a plate. When, when it's denied you, I think you appreciate and get involved more. But then again, Picasso never went to a posh school ever, you know. So <laughs> you could see things like that, that were, um, it embraced you to that. And um, so I suppose there was always that turmoil that they were a little bit shocked that I knew about that stuff, but I wasn't playing that game, you know. I wasn't built and socialised in that way. I come from the streets, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to go to university if... Um, if I couldn't get a, you know, if I was trying to avoid a job, but, um, you know, I didn't bother going. I ended up playing to people in universities that telling me they wanted to do what I did, you know. But, um, you know, I was a conscientious objector to work, which I told Pete, and then he started using the same line as well, you know. <laughs> told them it's that. a good line. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was, I knew yeah. when I was 16, you know, when you're doing your old levels, and people are going, if you get five, you like green shield stamps, you can uh, get a job in a bank. And I was, Friday of leaving school because I thought, I don't want to get into this real world, you know. Hmm. I've seen what it does to those people out there, browbeaten in the street, you know. And I had my emotions dragged down the street. But um, in 1965, you know, I saw a kid with a scooter and there was a place called Bellevue. It was like, um, it was like a Disneyland, but a bit more serious. It had, you know, animals and uh, things. And I saw a guy with a, a parker with the hoop painted on the back, you know. And also in 1965, the, the Kinks released this uh, record called Well Respected Man, which blew my mind because it was very real, you know. He does the girl next door and he's trying to get out, all that kind of stuff, There's a lot of darkness in that song. So that's really where I was coming from <clears throat> with the songwriting and the way I was approaching the music, you know. The one thing that, you know, smashing the pianos of the, uh, the art world, and the Who thing, the Rolling Stones thing, the Beatles thing, the Bob Dylan thing, all that, you know. I was uh, 10 years old listening to all that stuff. And, um, you know, it had a massive impact. Also, you needed to find your own way in all that as well. Yeah, because uh, cause that, you can hear echoes of that in Buzzcocks, mm. but it's, it sounds very much, it's mood. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, those, are, those are the groundswell, I mean, and, and, and Pete was the same, really, growing up with a lot of that stuff, you know. Um, so we had that there, but there was a lot of things uh, we did personally that was... A lot of groups try and be like the groups they're into, but we took a lot of things from life, you know. It was like 
what you was experiencing and what you were seeing around you was more important than like, oh, I can play that record, I'll try and be them, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what gave it, it Buzzcocks its uniqueness. We weren't that good of players, really. We hadn't done our, paid our dues in pubs and all mm -hmm. that. In fact, if I'd meet my folks in a social club, it's a frighten me to death seeing somebody doing Yellow River. Because you can actually play all cabaret. the covers. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm thinking the mentality of it, you know. I thought, yeah. I thought it'd be great to be a musician, but I couldn't do that. It, it was like, it's mind, mind blowing. It's a mind fuck, you know. Well, the 76 recordings of the Buzzcocks, the really early ones, you know, Spiral Scratch EP and mm. Time's Up as well, the, the bootleg album. Mm. They're so fantastic, it's so rudimentary, but they're still really great songs, you know. It's, it's making a lot out of not very much, which is, which is, you know, Spiral Scratch is probably the most perfect punk rock record statement. Yeah, I mean, that, that was amazing, you know, done a couple of hours in the afternoon. Um, because we had our wizards with us then. Uh, I suppose it was kind of our, Howard's idea and concept that the sort of a Mark One buzzcocks, they call it now. And um, we went in and he spat those lyrics out, which were amazing. And, you know, we banged along with it, you know. And um, it was so minimalistic that, um, you know, and it had this terrible sound courtesy of Martin Hunter. Yeah, but a lot of people forget beautiful. that, don't they? That's his first record, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, I've said it before, but, it, you know, when the engineer was making it sound good, he was just grabbing and pulling <laughs> the knobs, freaking the engineer out. <laughs> the guy's going, leave her alone. You're... <laughs> and to quote Yeats, yeah, a terrible beauty was born. Uh, Production-wise, it sounded terrible, but we realised it sounded amazing. Mm. Nothing out there sounded like it, you know. Um, and so that dealing with the unknown was was a great thing, you know. Yeah, you because know, it's quite interesting the idea of like ostensibly it's a punk band, it's, mm. but there's no such thing as punk. I mean, there's no templates. You can't sound like something that doesn't exist. So you're feeling your way in the dark, aren't you? I mean, yeah. How do you do that? Well, I mean, we kind of had an inbuilt gyroscope of. We kind of knew what we were doing in some way, or like there's this, there's this sense and sense and notion about us. Um, um, so when Howard was in the band, and then when he left, it was me and Pete with it. But we we all had a certain empathy somewhere. There was some weird spiritual, intellectual thing or whatever it was going on there, and um, that's kind of the essence and the the stuff of a of a buzzcock, really, you know. And um, it was a lot different than, than all the other punk bands. Well, there wasn't really any, really. We started two days <laughs> yeah. before the clash. I'm not even sure whether Anarchy in the UK was out when we started and when we, when we first started rehearse, rehearsing him. No, Actually, exactly. we I would mean, have heard it in the free yeah, trade. A few months, months after, record. yeah. yeah. So, I think Spire Scratch is the third punk single. Yeah, I think yeah. it probably was. And we, so we'd seen the Pistols and we'd opened up for them at the uh, free trade hall. Um, kind of heard there was a band called The Clash and The Damned and On The Hills and At The Jam as well, but we hadn't really heard the records. Well, you're doing this in the North. Us. There's nothing in the North at that no. time. Yeah. No, exactly, yeah. I mean, they, they all get, they're all hanging out in London. They, all, mm. they might be rivals, but they all know each other and they know what the template is, but mm. there's no internet then. This is totally in isolation, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, there was no distractions, no fancy clubs to go to and all that. You know, to be like a 70s nightclub that on a Tuesday night, you know. <laughs> it was a different Manchester, live. wasn't it? But it was Foo Foo's yeah. Palace. was the first. Well, you played. We played in yeah, there, yeah. there, but at first we, it was like, um, everywhere else there was sort of run down Bowie and Roxy rooms, Pips and that. And that was coming to its, the end of its sort of time in a way. And I think you had to have a, a, a suit and tie on everywhere else and all that. I remember getting in there tying a knot in a handkerchief and getting in that make that a tie, you know. Um, strict rules and regulations. So Foo Foo, uh, he used to let all the punks in, which is very early on in punk, you know. But that was his glamour. He was like a famous drag act. He was a famous drag act, a bit like a Lily Savage. Mm. He'd be doing like hen parties next door. And if a fight broke out, he'd come running in in his dress, bang their heads together, throw them out, and then <laughs> go back into the stage yeah. next door and carry on, you know. <laughs> Talk about hard, I mean. <laughs> um, so there was that. We eventually played there in the end. We thought, we'll have this little club, no stage or anything. But uh, it did, they did let us in. But the great thing about Manchester, there was no distraction. So all you had was your little room and a light bulb, which was very existential 
it made you look inside yourself and think about who you were, you know. So I think that gave us a, a density as a, being in a band like the Buzzcocks, you know. It, uh, it gave you that heaviness of like this self-realization stuff, you know, which um, came through in the records. Whereas if we'd have been in London, we'd be at the latest show business party and stuff. Uh, it'd be a bit more surface than that depth. Yeah, you know? more part of the music business. Yeah. So, so when, when Howard left, what was that? I mean, that's, he leaves, what's it, January the 7th, 77, before Punk's even really got out. Was yeah. that, that must have been quite a shock when your singer just goes. Well, it was, yeah. It was, um, we'd done, um, we'd done 10, 10 gigs, 10 shows, and uh, um, he was in the band six months, I think, overall. So we'd done 10 shows in between that, and then Spiral Scratch had just come out. I mean, Pete was at his house, sat on a sofa, and he said, uh, I've achieved what I wanted to do, um, I'm leaving. So we was really shocked, you know, it was like, you're the singer, we just got reviewed for this. <laughs> yeah. good. Um, me and Pete looked at each other and said, well, we're going to carry on, you know, we're in moments, because we had no choice, really. I mean, what else were we going to do? It was like, we just started this. But um, for me personally, it was the best thing I'd ever did. <laughs> And I did Love Magazine after, you got kind of two bands for the price of one. Mm. But um, for me, it was like, well, now Howard's left, it became a different band. Did it, how much did the dynamic change? Do you get but, like... A, well, the dynamic changed in terms of me and Pete on the guitars. And to be honest, I, uh, I had this song called I Might Need You, Do Not Do Want, Do What You Want, Don't Make Me Blue. Just to, It's all on the play I, you know. Because to be honest, I heard that Beatles thing, I should have known better. <laughs> So I think that eye is important. Mm. And I took a cassette round to Pete's and uh, he had to listen to that. And he said, it's good that. And he played it to Howard, but I don't think, I think it was too poppy for Howard really. And, um, but Howard had left and next minute Pete had come up with, what do I get? And... Um, so it's gave the bus lots an opportunity so to get you, more streamlined. You could see then, yeah. yeah. And then I come up with the promises one, and he put the words on that. So you could see then it started to go a different way, you know. I mean, the, the twin guitar thing, which is one of the key parts of Buzz Cox, the guitar's meshing, was that something right from the start after Howard left? Yeah. You got two guitars out. Mm. Was it a deliberate decision? Is that just the way you kind of played? Well, well but it was. I, on Spinal Scratch, I, I was on the bass, wasn't mm. I? Mm. And I was a fraud as a bass player, really. I hadn't played that You don't like playing the guitar. bass, do you? I've, I've seen don't... you play bass and you look... Pissed I've not off. played it for years, probably. <laughs> I only played it at the beginning just to join the band, you know. You know, um, it's probably like when Jimmy Page played in the Yardbirds or, you know, Paul McCartney played the bass because no one else would do it in, the, mm. uh, the, uh, in Hamburg, you know. It's, but it, for me, it was like, that's the way I, I was just looking to join a band at, at the beginning. So did the 10 shows and um, um, I said, look, I'll move over to guitar. I'll be a lot better at that. And, um, you know, I was writing songs for this other band and writing songs anyway, so I thought, this is better for me to do it this way and we'll get a bass player in. So that's what happened. And, um, you know, the buzz cults began to change then. We had, um, I'd say, the what do I get promises and songs like that. You could start to be a bit more tuneful rather than the stabby stuff, you know. The early stuff, the Howard days, was, you know, orgasmatic, da-da-da-da-da, and the boredom, da da like machine gun. These are a little bit more tuneful, so... Um, because also, we thought, we're done then, we've got to go somewhere else with this. And um, the twin guitars, they were sort of in and out of phase. We were playing the same thing a lot of the time, but it was sort of different, you know. They, and we had these little guitar lines, you know. Um, that's, I, I, I had this... Uh, when I first started playing guitar, six pound guitar, and it went out of tune all the time. So I learned to play Beethoven's Ninth on one string and a bit on the other. Da, 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 all to joy. <laughs> and then I learned how to play these little riffs because I was tired of tuning the guitar. Yeah. So all these little guitar motifs came in on the top of these, um, on these, you know, more tuneful songs we write. So you can see it was all developing into another thing then, and that's really. Um, what really made the the mainstay of the Buzzcocks set? Me and Shelley, Pete Shelley with them guitars. And the way we played together was amazing, that interaction. Mm. That was kind of priceless, you know. We, we didn't realise we had that, but 
And I like the way you deconstructed the sound all the time as well. So it's not just two guitars playing, you know, one lead, one rhythm. It's like the Stones, isn't it? You're switching mm. around. But every single song you do, mm. every single way you play those guitars is different. So by the time you get to the third album, mm. it's, it's, it's utterly deconstructed, but it still sounds like uh, Buzzcocks. Yeah, because... Now, was that something you were conscious of as you were doing it? There was... Um, because we... We went to see Can early on when we first formed and stuff. We was listening to Crowd Rock. And I had like a Stockhausen box set, and I recorded my mother once. Uh, she was vacuum cleaning outside my room when I was a kid, when I was sixteen, and I recorded the the <laughs> the, the Hoover and played it back through my stereo. So this is what it sounds like. So I, we was in. I was into noise that way for moments like that. Uh, so I had this hangover, and I was trying to. And I thought, this Hoover sounds amazing, you know, so, you, you know, and Pete was in your know, experimental stuff as well, you know, courtesy of Brian Eno, we knew all about that as well, but, you know, uh, so there'd be these angular moments and distorted moments. In, in sometimes when a, a nice catchy song, there'd be some really horrible distort, distorted moment mm. or some weird little noise and riff that I'd put in or Pete would put in. So it was never, never so perfect, you know. I mean, I would say that life's not perfect, so why should your guitar playing be perfect, you know? That reflects more imperfect guitar, you know? You also had a great rhythm section. That was really important. We had a fantastic rhythm section as well. So we had the two amazing guitar empathy with me and Pete. John Marr on the drums, who was fantastic. What a find. He was 16. 16. He'd only been playing six weeks. I <laughs> know, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, amazing. <laughs> and, um, he could, it was effortless. He could hit them uh, uh, skins so hard. When we'd be in studios, they'd go, you know, go around the kit and all that stuff. Now hit the snare and it'd like, <laughs> it'd front of life out of the engineers, you know. But rhythmically, and it was perfectly it was, yeah. timed as a, you know, timing was like a watch. It was like massively on time. And, um, and Steve Galvin and the bass, so the rhythm section took care of, you know, mm. all the other stuff that me and Pete was doing. So. What a fantastic band it was at that time. And all you know? at random just falling together. Just yeah. falling together. We, 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 and the only time we really rehearsed was when, when we were rehearsing to get some songs together. Um, it was never like we had to rehearse this combination of things, you know. And I always maintain it's who you are that make the dynamics of the thing. You can learn instruments and that, but it's the people, the stuff that comes out of you as a person. So. Wherever John Moore and Steve Garvey were, they, you know, they worked with me and Pete, you know. It's and we all got on very well. It's a fortunate chemistry, isn't it? Fantastic, yeah. you know. Some things happen in life, like me mm. meeting Malcolm McLaren outside him, introduced yeah. me to that. Pete meeting Howard, all the rest of it, these random elements, suddenly in the universe, that must have been the time for that. So it all came together. And uh, we, we actually... Uh, Joy Division recorded Love Will Tears Apart at that film it, in our rehearsal room. Um, TJM. T yeah. TJ. It's, um, that's where we, we did a lot of them hits. And we'd go in there about one o'clock and we'd have to be out by about 5.30 because the pubs were open. So that was the target. It's like, come on, <laughs> let's get on with this, you know. So there's lots of elements of that, that urgency of like, look, the pubs are on a bit, we can't be doing this all day, you know. <laughs> Which was a, a kind of light-eyed way from the, the heaviness that you'd been thinking at home, you know, be, uh, you'd be thinking of some heaviness behind the song or all that, but by the time you got it in the rehearsal room, it goes like this, or be, it goes like that, yeah, all right, let's get on with it, and then we need to get out. And mm. So there's that element to it, which, which was very important, really, because it made you do it. And you could hear other people next door going, oh, oh you know. <laughs> just doing their first intro to a new song about five times. By that time, we'd written about two hit singles and we're on top of the box. <laughs> yeah. we got but we, we kind, there was a kind of a disrespect, I no regard for it as well. We're going, look, that'll do. Mm. <laughs> well, if it's right, you can't, you, you can't mess with it, it's there, no, right? Yeah. If you sat down and painstakingly got too precious about it, you'd take all the magical elements, I mm, think. Yeah. Think about it too hard. Yeah, and yeah. all that. Yeah, you'd be going, oh, let me get that middle right a bit more and all that. So that was the element of danger with it and the excitement, which hopefully reflected when we played with the crowds, you know, when we played the crowds, it was like, 
There's elements in these songs that shouldn't be in or not quite right, but they kind of work in the way, you know. So it's very powerful, like you say, when you see us live. I mean, there's weird things going on as what you might think on the record was straightforward. It's not as straightforward as you think, you know. So mm. that gave it a, a powerfulness, a dynamic and, and, and some incredible magic, you know, and so, a forcefulness. Yeah. So you're the only buzzcock who's never left the band, aren't you? Yeah. 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 I always said I would at one point. I'm going to do a solo, <laughs> man. I never did. Boy, who cried wolf. Um, but yeah, because Howard left, then um, then Pete left. So I mean, was it what, was was the signs that Pete was going to go before that? Was that a similar situation? Howard it was just like, wow, where did that come from? Or was it you kind of well, knew? Well, we'd done about five years in each other's pockets. Uh, not and for high speed one, it is very yeah. Intense. I mean, it was like yeah. you know, we we were doing records. We were on tour all the time. And we were, you know, it sometimes was like Led Zeppelin, Hammer of the Gods, you know what I mean? We was partying and we were having hundreds of girls back at the hotels. I mean, you couldn't meet girls in, in, in nightclubs, you, you had no time. So you, you did it all on the road and it was amazing. So you had all that going on as well. So all this stuff starts to build up. You can kind of do it for a while. So after five years, of putting out records and doing things, something's got to give, and I think Pete started um, crumbling a little bit, really. Uh, particularly when uh, we ended up doing the last three experimental singles, which were great singles, a lot of the fans loved them, but EMI were looking for a hit, we're going, these are hits, but there's no A and B side, and um, they're not them simple, catchy ones you thought. Mm. These are cooler, really, you know, this is the next phase. Um, so suddenly, you know, the drugs came into the studio because we had Martin, you know, Martin Russian had done all these other ones. He, he did a fantastic job, Fan actually. Amazing job. Yeah. He was the man for the job, really. But we got Martin uh, Hanna back and all the he drugs. Doesn't, he doesn't suit Buscock sound, I don't think. No. Even though he's a brilliant producer. No, them yeah. six songs, to be honest, God forgive me, Martin, but they would have been a lot better with Martin Russian. Mm. But Martin was away in New York somewhere and it was like, so, so, so let's get on with it. Oh, let's bring my uh, Hannah back. So of course you couldn't start then. So the joints, the coke came, and the and it eventually the acid and all this. And it was like, what would it take about a week and a half to do six songs? So weeks and weeks, three different studios. Mm. So the focus is completely gone. Yeah, because um, that's one of the great things about Buzzcocks. Mm. Early period, everything is so focused, and yeah. detailed, and perfect. I mean, we'd go in and do all them, al them early albums with Martin uh, Russ and um, we'd go in straight at 12 o'clock and be out by 7.30, say. Then we'd go to the pub and do mm. bits, whatever we wanted to do. But we were straight every day and I'd say to any band, that's the best way to do it, you know. You're kidding yourself all them other ways, you know. And when we got to that stage of like, well, let's do this in the studio. i say it took three studios, uh, I think it was Advision, and Vision, uh, the townhouse was there for like 10 days and then we end up in Strawberry Studios. Mm. And it's still all that and this craziness. And them songs were really good songs, but I think it, if Martin uh, uh, Russian had a producer and they'd done them the old way, they would have come out a lot better, you know. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of potential, them songs. Oh, I love those songs. Running Free, yeah. Strange Just Things. As you say, the sound is what... Sound was great, yeah. you know, on all them, you know. Mm. Um, and uh, that was saying it further from, because on the first album we had fiction romance and we had autonomy, which was, they were signs on the first album that were taking punk uh, to other areas. Because mm. everybody was quite linear at that time, you know, quite Ramonesy or that kind of way, you know. Mm. Um, and on that first album we did that and then, of course, we started visiting that on the, on the last three singles, taking it a bit further, you know which was still a thing that wasn't mined enough, really. I think we'd have done more albums, we should have done a bit more of that, with the pop songs as well in there, but there kind of moving to potential. Kind of moving to post-punk, which you kind yeah. of pioneered, like you're saying, yeah. on, on the well, first, on the first album. album, that was pioneered. Even Spiral yeah. Scratch has hints of what's coming there. Yeah. yeah. You know, man, I don't mind and all that. The promise is, what do I get that stuff? But, we, you know, the uh, fiction romance, uh, pulse beat, autonomy. Mm. That on the first album suggested you could take punk somewhere else. Mm. Which is one of the things I love about Buzzcocks. It was experimental and pop at the same time. Yeah, which mm. um, sort of pushed it forward, mm. you know. Mm. 
other bands like Wire and all that started doing things, and, mm. you know, whatever it inspired people to go, you know, it doesn't just have to be this straightforward thing, which people thought, you know, the Ramones were kind of the blueprint with a mm. couple of 60s things, but, uh, you know, we was using our other influences, you know, the so, noise yeah. and the chaos. So where, where do you go now? Obviously, it's... I mean, I've got to say about harmony in my head. I mean, that, yeah. that's, that was about the noise and the chaos in the street, you know. Mm. Because I'd done promises, I thought, I've, now we're on top of the pops every week, I'm going to do a, a steamroller song that'll stand next to a, uh, Anarchy in the UK and, uh, and maybe White Riot by The Clash, you know. Uh, let's have some of this now. I've done my pop song promises. Peter, done, what do I get? I don't mind. So we've got the foot in the door at the top of the box, let's give it some. And that's what I wanted to do, just to show you that still the punk roots. Well, it's, it's, it's a great, powerful song, but you've still got minor chords in it, haven't you? Oh, yeah, still yeah, got yeah. the minor chords, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Still a bit of sensitivity. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's not a total your band from, is it? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but it's very voice cock still, yeah. yeah. I'd read, uh, you know, the James Joyce Ulysses thinking, oh, that cinematic imagery, you know. So I tried to come from as many things as I could and imagine walking down Market Street to the cacophony of the noise. Mm. I listen to the high street wailing sounds in a queue. I go up from my walk in saying social news, the defiance of the news around you being young. Don't let it get me down, I'm long in the tooth and all that. And what it was, it was the percolation of the crowds in the streets and at the bus stops in Manchester when it was all bubbling. That was the harmony. Mm. It was the beautifulness of all the tragic lives of people. Uh, I was thinking about that home and sound in the town centre of Manchester and everywhere else. That was very important. It was like, but that's a home and that's life. That's mm. the sound of life here. That's a noise in itself. You know, I wasn't trying to go, oh, I've got something wrong with my mind or something. It was about that. Mm. Then, of course, you read Plato was thinking about harmony and stuff, uh, philosophically and then, so you put it on that level. But it was really about that, the beauty of the the noise of the Manchester, and they'd just built the uh, Arndale Centre and stuff like that. It was like the alienation of that, you know. Mm. That was the Kafka F bit to it. <laughs> yeah. If I can too, say it with my Too team. early in the morning for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, so there's that yeah. element, uh, 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 the, the experimental things and the noise things. You know, I mean, running free, I did an interview in America a couple of years back. And then I said, I love this song. I play it a lot on my radio show and I get calls saying, who is that? And he goes, I'm all delighted to say that's the Buzzcocks and they never realise, you know. Mm. Yeah, surprising people. Yeah, yeah. and that, with the, looking back, that is a great song. Mm. Badly mixed by Martin Hanna, but keyboard £100 from Johnny Roadhouse in Manchester. <laughs> Stuff like that. And um, what did Pete have around that time? Uh, well, a strange thing and stuff like that. So uh, that was all good stuff, mm. you know. So where now? You know, obviously, like, what, well, Pete's died. It's mm. probably the saddest bit of news last year in, in our world. Mm. But, but you, you're kind of left with an odd quandary, aren't you? You've got, you're a key member of one of the classic bands mm. of our generation. Do you carry on? I mean, obviously, the Arbor Hall gig's coming up, and that's the celebration of, of Buzzcocks and Pete's and everything. But can you continue as a... As a well, yeah, I mean, um, the album was going to be a Buzzcocks gig. Now it's going to be a, a lovely memorial for Pete. Um, I never thought when we booked that we'd, it would change to that. Um, yeah, um, people are willing me to carry on, you know, because we almost looked a bit similar when we were younger. You know, I'm, like, oh, I'm, st I'm still the alive one, if <laughs> you see what I mean? It's like, well, you carry on, Steve. So I think I will, and I'll be honoured to do his songs. And... Um, I'll be doing a lot of my songs from the Buzzcocks days that we we, ne we never did sometimes. Mm. It's well, about one third of the songs are yours, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, at least. I mean, there's a lot. I'm just doing a lyric book now, and um, I'm having a job remembering some of the songs I did. Cause I had a band flag of convenience in mm. the 80s, and I've just done, um, I'm on my fifth solo album, so I'm thinking I've done a lot of work really. Now, a lot of people. It's a bit more underground, my solo. Well, not in terms of accessibility, just in terms of not in the spotlight, uh, in the spotlight on top of the pops or something with the, my solo stuff. But there's a lot of good stuff there that people like and have been with me on their journey on that, you know. So I'll put some elements in that in, and people do want me to play some of that stuff, but I'll do a lot of Buzzcock songs that we haven't done for years, mm -hmm. including some of Pete's that we never got around to. So 
to give the fans that and um, keep the flame alive for Pete and for myself, you know, because mm. there's a good body of work there. I could walk away from it and do my solo stuff and I have thought about that and then I thought, well, it'd be a shame to let that die yet. I'm still alive for a few years, <laughs> hopefully, but... And, and, you, you, know, ne and you still I, never left. I still <laughs> never left, yeah. I mean, Pete, and jo uh, Pete left, then John and... Uh, then Steve Garvey left, then uh, John Barr left. Mm. But I never threw the towel in, so maybe that's why I'm still here doing it. I always had the belief in it, I would have kept it on all the way through anyway, you know. Mm. Various members went the way, you know, lost the faith for a moment here and there. But they all had to come back at, at some point during this journey. But, um, okay, well, yeah. thanks a lot. Thank Steve Diggle, the man who never left. Thanks a lot. Yeah.